this is Carlos. I just basically did the video and I noticed when I finished that I forgot to record. So I'm hoping that this one's recording. But I want to talk to you today about the most unexamined period of Marx's life, which is his latter years. Uh, it, it's basically a, a somewhat loose summary of the book review I just published of Marcello Musto's The Last uh, Years of Karl Marx, an intellectual biography. I recommend all those who can uh, to buy a copy. It's a very uh, insightful look at both his life and his work at the time. Uh, I had uh, already previously engaged for quite some time with some of the unpublished notebooks that uh, Marx uh, wrote in those last few years. Specifically, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the collection published in 72 by Lawrence Crater called the Ethnological Notebooks, where Marx is dealing primarily with Henry uh, Lewis Henry Morgan's Ancient Societies, which was a seminal text for uh, Engels' The Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the State, but also with uh, John Bud Fears, The Irian Village, Henry Summer Mains, Lectures on the Early History of Institutions, and John Lubbock's uh, The Origin of Civilizations. Um, so this book, this collection from uh, uh, Crater has been published in 72, but yet it hasn't received much attention. The, the place where it has uh, gotten the most attention has really been Latin America because of the nature of the comments that Marx makes here on the categorization of these original communities and all the potential that these communities might have towards the movement of socialism and these comments are more intensified when we look at the what's what's known as the Kovalevsky uh, notebooks uh, which are his notes on a book from one of his close scientist friends uh, the Russian anthropologist Maxim Kovalevsky and the book is called communal land ownership the causes course and consequences of its decline so the first uh, thing that I want to point at that's quite interesting in this latter period are his anthropological studies uh, which provide quite a few uh, smaller changements uh, smaller changes and uh, uh, perhaps one more major one the major one i think is the role that he sees in the family uh, he understood the family to be the basic social unit um, even in Capital Volume 1, if you have a modern edition of Capital, you would see that some of his comments on the family, they're actually corrected in the footnotes by Engels. Uh, he goes from thinking uh, the basic bourgeois notion that the family is the, uh, the social unit, the basis of society, to moving beyond that to understanding with the studies of Lewis Henry Morgan, that the family and monogamy contains the germ for both slavery and serfdom, that uh, the word family itself, its etymology, goes back to servitude and that it implies um, slavery. And so he would, he would argue, after his engagement with Lewis Henry Morgan, um, that in the family we have the first class uh, distinction, and that's between the male and the female, and the division of labor that's created uh, through um, monogamy and if, if you want more on that uh, I highly recommend Engels' uh, text The Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State but those are some of the, the first implications that you get from his readings of Lewis Henry Morgan there's a transformation in how he sees historically the role of the family there's also the confirmation of the fact that the state is something transitory in nature and something that has been used ever since the beginning of its existence as a tool to oppress the classes which are not uh, at the top, the classes which are not uh, using itself, the, using the state itself as an instrument of its dominion. This is something that uh, Lewis Henry Morgan proposes quite clearly that no, the state is not eternal, it hasn't always existed. And, you know, we might look back at this now and be like, Perhaps it's not too radical, you know, uh, but there is a radical implication here. And, and just to sidetrack a little bit, uh, this is something that I emphasize with my students uh, in, in the transition in bourgeois philosophy, 
from John Locke to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, because the former uh, Locke sees that property is something natural. As soon as you work on something, you get property. Rousseau doesn't. Rousseau is a much more dialectical thinker who realizes that things emerge in history and that history is constantly changing and that the notions of what it constitutes to be a human being, the, the notions of uh, human essence and, and human nature that arise in a specific era are really projections of the prejudices of that era back onto the history of humanity. That's something he notices uh, quite well. He does the same projections, but he does it less than other thinkers. And that's why he's one of the um, uh, figures in, in bourgeois uh, philosophy, which we appreciate the most. But that statement, that, that, that the anthropological discovery that uh, Lewis Henry Morgan makes, that the state is not something eternal, that's very radical. Because if you're fighting against an existing order, it is much more difficult in terms of just the subjective aspect of motivation to fight against something that you think has always existed. If you realize that what you're fighting against is a historical emergence, it is something that has came about in history. And further, if you're conscious of the fact that the reason why it came about was because of specific changes that took place in human arrangements um, that were both conditioned, but also the result of human will, right? Um, if you're conscious of that, you realize that it's changeable, that you can change the existing order of things because it hasn't always been like this. So that comment on the state reinforces the view that Marxism has had since the 1840s. Um, another important aspect of uh, Musto's book, again, again the, the, the last years of Karl Marx, uh, is his analysis of something that I, I actually spent a, around half a year to a year uh, working on when I was an undergrad. Um, no publication ever came out of it because I was, of course, an undergrad. I wasn't really writing then. Um, but is uh, his analysis of Maxim Kovalevsky, as I mentioned, the Russian anthropologist friend of his. And uh, Kovalevsky was uh, studying both uh, the Aztecs and the Incas in the Americas and in pre-Columbian pre -Columbian America. And he was also studying the Indian uh, social forms and one of, although Marx found Kovalevsky's work very interesting and insightful and agreed with him on, on quite a few things, one of the central critiques that Marx provides is that Kovalevsky projects the categories that basically Marx and, and most historians in the West agree you can divide Europe with. He projects those to these other regions. So he uses categories like feudalism and projects them on areas that have completely different concrete conditions than those which have emerged in uh, specifically Western Europe. So here Marx uh, kind of breaks against, against uh, the unilateral theory of history and says that, no, you can't just a priori, so before experience uh, fit different parts of the world uh, into categories that we have used to divide a specific part of the world. If you look at the social relations that existed in the Aztec community, in the Inca communities, in India, you will find that there's something quite different than feudalism. There's something quite different than, than slavery. They're quite different than uh, capitalism in any of the phases uh, of capitalism. But they're also not a primitive uh, community. So they're not the, 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 that first uh, stage, as is usually laid out in the unilateral theory of history. Right. Um, so so that's uh, another big point. And with that is the understanding that um, these communities have already a communistic ethos. They have a, a, a communist spirit. Their social relations are communistic. A lot of the times the property is held in common. And if there's antagonisms developing, they're still in a very embryonic stage. There is internal contradictions. He lays that out in his notes on Kovalevsky. There's also external contradictions. The, uh, the, the, um, the relation that the community might have to a capitalism that's expanding and that's threatening its form of life and uh, making it possible that the community that might have been uh, existing with a quite similar structure for thousands of years 
back, it, it could be dissolved because of that expan expansion of capitalism. So he's not like utopian about it. He's a very uh, realist and, and, and concrete thinker. He, he notices that there's contradictions here, but he leaves his mind open to saying that, well, if these structures uh, engage with the existing modes of production in a struggle, so if the, if the let's call it peasantry, although that's not a, an appropriate category because we're uh, uh, projecting that one from the West, um, if these communities engage in the struggle against capitalism and they're victorious and are able to get a hold of the forces of production that have uh, been brought about by Western European capitalism, they will be able to develop socialism uh, and they can be globally of, uh, 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 of great assistance for the international proletarian movement towards socialism. So that's something that is coming about in his readings of Kowalewski that's covered uh, in a few pages. He doesn't, uh, Musto doesn't delve too much into this, but he covers it substantially. Uh, the difficulty with the Kowalewski notebooks is that they have been uh, locked away in the B140 file in uh, the Institute. Let me see if I'm correct. Um, in the Institute, International Institute of Social History in the Netherlands. Uh, and it wasn't until, I believe, 2014 that they were first published in Bolivia. Uh, again, Bolivian Marxism has taken an interest in this because they argue that the Marxists in Latin America have been just projecting that unilateral theory of history and it has affected the concrete analysis of these regions. And subsequently, if you don't have a concrete analysis of the existing relations in your uh, uh, in your uh, region, you will be unable to formulate the right strategies and tactics to fight for socialism. You will lay focus on certain uh, aspects uh, or, or on certain classes and not on others, and, and it might dilute the water um, about uh, concerning how to move forward in the struggle towards socialism. So Kowalewski is another uh, in important part of uh, Musso's book. Uh, the most important part of uh, Musto's text is uh, the second chapter, which deals with uh, the question of the Russian obshina, which is the rural commune in Russia. And this is, again, something that I had uh, studied a bit before, but uh, Musto contextualizes Marx's engagement with the question of the rural commune in Russia and the history of the writings from uh, Nikolai Chernyshevsky, who was the Russian socialist, uh, populist, socialist, populist uh, philosopher and literary critic who wrote What is to be Done, which, of course, we know is also the title of Lenin's 1902, 1902 text. Let me see if it's 1902. Yeah, 1902 text. Um, so Chernyshevsky was a populist and uh, a quite dialectical thinker who argued that you can basically accelerate development in the countries that are backwards because the development already took place in the advanced countries. So that uh, historically, the nations that develop the latest, when it comes to their development, they can do it quicker because the development has already taken place. So uh, he says that, for instance, when a social phenomena has reached a high level of development in one nation, in one nation, uh, its progression to that stage in another more backwards nation may occur rather more quickly than it did in the advanced nation. Right. So this is uh, common sense. And he he gives us a nice quote. He says that history is, is like a grandmother who is terribly fond of its smallest children to the latecomers. It gives not the bones, but the marrow. So it gives that uh, which is the best to uh, the latecomers because, again, we are standing on the shoulders of giants when an underdeveloped nation tries to uh, develop because development has already taken place in another region of the world. Um, 
that development is is easier because the machinery has a is already in place. It's, it's just a matter of getting a hold of it. That was his thesis. Uh, of course, we know that imperialism makes it so that these uh, underdeveloped regions of the world do not develop. Um, but Chernyshevsky's point was that you have the conditions in Russia for socialism because Russia is engaged in the world market uh, with Western Europe. It has access to the forces of production that capitalism has been able to develop. So basically, from grounded in the communistic ethos of the of China, of the rural community, you can develop socialism by getting a hold of the forces of production that have developed in the West. So that was his uh, position. And Marx absolutely loved Chernyshevsky. Um, he, uh, he said that he read almost every single one of his books, that he wanted even to write a book about Chernyshevsky so that people in the West can come to know him. So uh, Marx had already, from the beginning, he starts learning Russian in 1869. Uh, and all throughout the 70s, he's studying agrarian conditions uh, in, in, in Russia, and most specifically ground rent in, in particular, to try to understand really what's what's going on um, in in the struggle against the czar. So um, the question gets posed to Marx in, I believe, 1877, uh, because a, a literary critic of the liberal wing of the populist, Nikolai uh, Mikhailovsky, writes a paper titled Karl Marx before the tribunal of Mr. Zukovsky. And in that paper, he basically says, look, guys, if you're Marxist, you should be very happy at the fact that capitalism is coming here to expropriate the peasants, because you know that although it might be evil now, uh, in the long run, this is just the first step, step towards uh, your ultimate goal, which is uh, eventually a beneficial uh, progress of uh, communism, right? Um, so he makes that article uh, quite cynical. It's published in Patriotic Notes. And Marx wrote a letter reply, which he never sent. But in that letter reply, he says that uh, what Mikhailovsky was doing was basically universalizing the schema that uh, Marx had drawn up because of his concrete studies of Western Europe and just using that and exporting that everywhere. Uh, he never sent the letter, though. And in uh, 1881, again, there's a, a letter from Vera Sasulich, who is a, a Russian socialist uh, populist militant, who sent Marx a letter and basically said that, you know, this is a life or death question that I'm asking you. The personal fate of Russian revolutionary socialists depends on your answer. And Marx writes four drafts. Uh, in reply to Vera Sisulich, the first few are very long. Uh, and then the last one that he ends up sending is quite short. It's just a few pages. And he's dealing with a question that, again, he had to think about in what would have been his reply to Mikhailovsky. Um, he's dealing with a question that he's engaged with as a reader of Chernyshevsky. Um, and the question that Vera Sisulich asks him is that right now there's a split in the socialist movement between those that think that the rural commune has a revolutionary potential, that it can uh, sustain uh, its relations, its social relations, which are communistic, uh, and that all it really needs to do is engage and, and, and absorb the modernized forces of production so that it can have socialism. And therefore, that the strategy of socialists should be to work with the commune and to try to do everything possible to get the forces of production there, to develop the forces of production. The other side said that no, that the commune is a remnant of the past and that its destiny is disillusion and that we should focus on the development of capitalism because the development of capitalism creates the conditions for the possibility of socialism. Now that was the Marxist position, that's the position that is expressed in capital, that is the position that was expressed in the Grand Dries, which of course they didn't read, 
That is a position expressed in the manifesto. That's the Marxist position. That is what scientific socialism allows you to do after a concrete analysis of uh, the process of capitalism as a whole. You come to realize that because of its internal contradictions, it creates its own grave diggers in the form of the proletariat. So it is natural that Marxists at that time were heading towards there. Now, what they wouldn't have expected uh, was what Marx ended up answering. And he said that basically that uh, because of his studies of this region and because of the specific and unique historical characteristics that Russia had, I mean, think about it. Uh, before capitalism in the West, which, you know, according to the, the from chapter 26 on of Capital Volume 1, when he's talking about primitive accumulation, we're talking about the 14th to the 16th century. It really takes off with Holland. Um, but uh, before the development of capitalism in the West, you nonetheless had private property, right? The land wasn't held community in many regions. There were some regions where it was, but generally uh, the feudal structure was one in which the peasant uh, basically had private property in the uh, the allotted plant uh, plot of land that they would work. So uh, property was individualized. It wasn't capitalist private property, but it was individualized. There wasn't a commune like there was in Russia. Uh, so he says that that if you're going to have that his that strict historical schema, you have to realize that what well, we haven't had in the West a commune <laughs> or, or or this primary community for ages, right? Before the last four or five hundred years of capitalism, we had feudalism and then we had slavery. So we didn't have that commune for a very very long time. So that's already you know, a difference that has to be calculated. Um, you haven't had the intermediary stages that has led the West to capitalism in the first place. So that's one of the points that he makes. The other points that he, that he makes is that the commune um, exists in a country which is connected to Western markets. And that because of that connection, it is possible that the commune could get a hold of somehow, he doesn't, he's not very specific how, but that the commune could get a hold of the forces of production that were developed by the capitalist West. And in so doing, if it is able to sustain its relations of, of production, right, uh, in, that, in that more advanced form, it would be able to uh, serve uh, as, a, as almost a vanguard of socialism and an ally to the international proletariat. This is, again, not something he's trying to export anywhere or everywhere else. This is just something that he's a conclusion that he's arriving at out of a concrete study of the conditions in Russia, which is something that we should be doing everywhere. That's what dialectical materialism, that's what our method implies doing, a, a concrete scientific studies of the conditions, uh, historical and contextual and geopolitical of the places in which we're in, because that's how we're going to be informed how the movement towards socialism should probably look like. Uh, but anyways, his conclusion ends up being that, yes, you know, the commune can do this. It faces some challenges. It faces internal contradictions. It faces external contradictions. It's going to face pressures from capital to overthrow it. But if it's able to successfully beat capital and its expansion to uh, try to bring about the dissolution of the commune, and if it's able to incorporate within it an advanced, modernized uh, 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 um, forces of production, it is able to bring about socialism. So, yes, you should focus your organizing energies on the rural commune, not completely, but you should focus some organizing energies on the rural commune. So that letter he sends back, it doesn't get published, but in the second uh, edition of the manifesto in Russian, uh, the preface comes to a similar conclusion, and then that's published uh, in in one of the main populist papers there, I'm forgetting what the 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 paper People's Will People's Will is what the paper's name is, um, and that one he writes with Angles. So Angles seem to be on on board with him on that, and that shows again uh, Marx basically accepting the position that Chernyshevsky had, which is that in the underdeveloped places of the world, because development already took place somewhere else, you can accelerate 
uh, yourself. It's almost a sort of historical accelerationism. Um, now, whether the 20th century has confirmed or disconfirmed Marx's openness to this question um, is, is, is up for examination. I, I think that we can see today that capitalism has, in fact, basically universalized. Um, even in the places where it's uh, under control of a uh, centralized government headed by a communist party, uh, there are the, the there is the existence of capitalism in, in, in those regions, although it's it's weird. It's, it's almost a mixed mode of production. That's not the topic of, of today's uh, video. But anyways, um, the question is, is still, I think, up for debate. You know, was this uh, openness that Marx had, was it necessary? Did capitalism end up, as he says in the first preface to the communist, I mean, to the to capital, to the first volume of capital, that capitalism was going to uh, basically expand everywhere that and that uh, the places where it is expanding in the developed nations, it, it's basically showing the image of the future of the underdeveloped nations, right? It's an open question, but it's an interesting part of Marxist scholarship that, that's under uh, under examined, right? And the way that the Bolsheviks tackled the question was that, yes, there is a revolutionary potential um, in the Russian peasantry. And um, let Marxism, Leninism is very clear about that. There is a revolutionary potential in the peasantry. Mao is very clear that there is a revolutionary potential in the peasantry. So what's interesting is that the people that appeal to this Marx in order to counter Marxism-Leninism, which Musto is, is one of these people who um, is hostile to Marxism-Leninism. It doesn't influence the scholarship much, so I recommend you read the book, even if you're a Marxist-Leninist and you disagree with uh, his anti-Marxist-Leninist positions. Uh, but what's interesting is that those conclusions were accepted by both the Bolshevik and uh, the um, the Chinese Revolution, where they used to lend a category from, from Western Europe, basically their peasantry in the revolutionary process. They understood that the peasantry was a force that, although ambiguous, could be used progressively towards uh, the movement towards socialism. Now, the last thing that uh, is brought about in uh, Bustos, the young Karl Marx, uh, is the telling of the story of the 72 days that Marx spent uh, in Algiers which again is another part that is under examined. Um, at that time, they were sending people who were sick out on basically vacations all over the place in order to find climates that were better suited to the sort of sicknesses they had. So uh, Marx had a lung uh, disease and he got moved around to a few places in those last few years. and. The last place he was moved to was Algiers. Um, he went there. He didn't really want to go, um, but he ended up going because he thought that if he felt better, he could finish Capital. Now, I'm not talking about Capital Volume 2 or 3. He basically understood that unless he had a very drastic recovery, he wasn't going to be able to finish those. He wanted a third edition, a third German edition of Capital Volume 1. He was a perfectionist. He was constantly trying to perfect capital. But um, he spends 72 days in Algiers. And although he doesn't get any better because the weather wasn't as expected, uh, he is able to nonetheless uh, send out a, a few letters which show that um, his anti-colonial spirit, you know, there was dogma that was repeated over and over again, specifically by... Um, pseudo-bourgeois radical academia that Marxism uh, is not actually very left-wing, that it sides with colonialism, uh, and that, that Marxists are ultimately uh, colonialism sympathizer, uh, sympathizers. Um, and that's false, right? And that's false if you read any of Marx's work, um, and it's specifically false if you read his, uh, his, his stories that he um, tells Lara and the other people he's writing to about Algiers. He's very critical of how brutal the French authorities are. Um, he's very uh, interested in uh, in the culture that he experiences there, um, in Arab culture. He tells a story to Lara about a group of Arabs, uh, some that were uh, dressed 
of like if they had money very richly others that were dressed poorly and they were just playing cards um and he's like you know it's it's crazy uh, uh, for them they really embody uh the the fact that under muhammad's eyes uh, they're all equal regardless of what um what their luck of the draw was in terms of uh, uh economic positions in terms of class but they all hang around at least in the in the social sphere and, and what we can call civil society in bourgeois and in, 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 in bourgeois society uh they all hang around as equals right which is something you don't really see in bourgeois society so that was something that that uh that kind of stunned him um but he was also just giving out stories that were quite amusing that he was hearing um in his time in algiers so after he comes back from algiers is uh, when jenny chen dies and then shortly after he dies as well and I, i believe i mentioned this at the beginning uh he was in such bad pain that literally the last thing he wrote to his doctor was that you know i kind of get happy when i get a headache because the physical pain distracts uh the mental pain the the pain uh that he's feeling because of uh all that he's lost in in those last few months um so i would definitely recommend uh, muso's book it's a great piece of scholarship and uh given that uh, mega has so mega is the uh, uh in german it's the Marx and Engels Gesamtes Gebe which is basically the collection of Marx and Engels's work they had stopped after the fall of the Soviet Union but they started printing again in 1998 um and there's projected to be 114 volumes 27 have been published so far i believe that there was 50 when they stopped so there's a whole lot of marxist scholarship to be done uh it, we're not just you know engaging with the same material there's a lot of new stuff coming out again there's been 27 volumes of writings and notes and letters uh between Marx and Engels that have came out uh, since 1998 and there is a whole lot more left to come they're expected to conclude with 114 so scholarship in the late Marx I reckon is going to uh begin to increase um what we must always remember though is that uh we must always center marx in the class struggle if we sustain marx in academia if we make reading these rare manuscripts uh something that we do just for publication it's lost its purpose right marxism is not just a way of theoretically interpreting uh the world economic structures culture and all the other aspects of uh, that are included within an existing form of life it is a way of changing the world marxism helps us interpret in order to then change the world so if you engage with it in the academia in academia you always got to bring it back to the shop floor you got to bring it back to the streets somehow uh in order for it to be meaningful and in part that's that's uh that's what we're trying to do uh here so um I'm guessing this yeah it's a 33 minute video um so I if you stayed this uh, long around thank you for watching again this is Midwestern Marks I hope you all take care in these uh very interesting time times and uh I would link the article to I would pin the article in 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 the comments uh, if you want to check that out so thank you and see you